All right, Mike, I, I exaggerate from time to time, but I think this is actually one of the watershed moments for our show because one of the things that you and I always love to do is talk to the, the players and the coaches and the people who are at school at the same time you and I were at school. And so for us, our basketball coach wasn't Johnny Dawkins, although he's doing really well. It wasn't Donnie Jones. Kirk Sparrow was our basketball coach, Mike. We went to a bunch of games in the old arena, Kirk's jerks, uh, the whole uh, the whole shebang. And, uh, and and Kirk has been someone we've been wanting to have on the show. He's had a, a really good career and recently announced his retirement. So he's got some time, I guess, on his hands, and he's willing to join us on the show now. Let's bring in uh, former UCF basketball head coach Kirk Spira, kind enough to join us on the Sons of UCF. Coach, first off, thank you so much for doing this. We're uh, really excited to have you on the show. Well, well thanks for having me on. It uh, brings back some old memories, you know, that you were talking about the uh, the old arena and – and. Uh, the old tack, all that kind of stuff, but uh, looking forward to this. Well, we're just going to get started, Coach. I always like to start at the beginning. So you are, uh, you're an assistant coach at the University of Florida, and you're up there in Gainesville. And tell us how you get it connected with UCF. You get a phone call, somebody tell you about an opening. How do how do you get connected with that that UCF job that came open after Joe Dean left? Well, that was kind of interesting. Of course, I knew Joe Dean, and he was a terrific coach, and and. Uh, you know, had a lot of respect for him and his dad, you know, he's a, his dad was a legend um, in the broadcasting and, and coaching area. But no, I was, uh, had been in Florida. I was at Florida Southern for a while. I was at Pensacola junior college as a head coach there for a while. And then with Lon Kruger at Florida, as you mentioned, and UCF came open and, and um, you know, I had a desire to be a head coach. So, um, you know, I had applied uh, at UCF, um, you know, they had, been division one for what nine or 10 years i think when they hired me um had struggled um you know with um being able to win a lot of games making that transition from division two to division one they were such an outstanding division two program with torchy clark and all that great division two history um but i thought it was um you know a chance to be a head coach in a program that would um was young and and maturing and and uh, thought it would be good. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, I think Joe Dean re <clears throat> announced his um, re retirement from coaching, basically, uh, I think late February. So I had applied in March and thought that, um, you know, they'd hire somebody by, you know, April, early April, mid-April, something like that. Um, and Florida at that time, uh, we were going on a on a foreign tour to Australia in May. Well, it got to be pretty close to, you know, the beginning of May. And I talked to Coach Kruger. I said, Coach, I don't know that they're that UCF is going to hire anybody um, before I go. I don't know whether to go on the foreign trip or not. And I decided to go on uh, on the foreign trip because UCF was waiting to hire an athletic director, which eventually was Steve Sloan. And so they weren't going to hire a basketball coach until, you know, they hired the athletic director. So I just said, hey, I'm going on an Australian trip. And, and if I am booted out of the running at UCF, you know, that that would be my mistake. But uh, they didn't hire Coach Sloan until middle of July, I believe. I wasn't hired until like July 29th. So I didn't have any any recruiting all that summer, um, you know, I think they had a tough time recruiting the year before when when Joe was leaving. Um, so I, I just came in with a didn't have any of the, the players that I had recruited at all. It was all guys that were already here. So that was an interesting dynamic. But um, fortunately for Coach Sloan, he, he chose me and we had a great time at UCF. Sorry, really quickly. You said you applied. It's 1993. Were you literally filling out like paperwork, like name, birth date, address? Was that like the application process? That was the application process. Wow. I, I don't think that, you know, these search firms really hadn't taken hold yet. Sure. You know, I, that was just starting to to come about a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I, I went through the whole um, application process, mailing in not even, you know, not even emailing, it was mailing in, you know, uh, resumes and, and, um, uh, my, my contact sheet and, and that type of thing, making calls to, um, you, know, whoever I could make calls to couldn't even make a call to an AD. Cause as I mentioned, they didn't hire coach Sloan until July. So I was trying to figure out, well, 
chairman of the search committee and finding out who's all in the search committee it ended up being like 25 or 26 people on the search committee it was just enormous and um and that was a, a whole thing too when you do did get an interview i don't know if they they brought in three or four people i can't really remember for on-campus interviews but you sit down in front of you know uh, a small um group of 20 25 people and you got these questions coming at you from all all different sides of the room and so that uh, that was kind of an interesting interview process I, I imagine things have, have changed quite, uh, quite, quite a bit. drastically since then. Also, I'd love a copy of that resume. If you still have that resume laying around, <laughs> I just love the idea of like Kirk Spira uh, coach, like, you know, won this many games. I think, I think that's fun. But take us back to that time. So 1993 is when you step on campus. We know what it looks like now. What would it look like then? What were facilities? I know the arena was still there. What was, what was the infrastructure like for UCF basketball in 1993? Well, I'll even go back a little bit farther than that because I was an assistant at Florida Southern when – um, UCF was division two. So we had a big rivalry, Florida Southern, UCF, sure. Rollins. Um, so when we would come over to, to the games or scout, you know, I, as I recall, we came in on highway 50 off of the 408 somehow. Sure. And, uh, you know, you didn't have 417 and all that stuff. So you get, um, highway 50 and you take a left on Alafaya trail and there's, there was a gas station, I think, on that corner. And from Highway 50 on Alafaya Trail until you got to the school entrance, there wasn't anything. You know, it, it was pitch black when you came at night. And, uh, you know, from that point in time until I came down to interview in 93, 94, obviously they had a lot more retail air uh, stuff going up and, and um, you know, more highway and that type of thing. So it had changed you know, from the last time that I had been to UCF, but yeah, there was, um, you know, ha you had your big circle around campus as far as a roadway. Um, but the number of buildings was minimal, you know, they had, you know, your big administration building with the pond behind it. And, and then you had the gym, um, you know, on campus, which was a part of the education, physical yeah. education department. Um, and they had just built that, uh, you know, the other, which is now the practice facility, that was the, the gym at that point in time. And they just had stands on two sides. Uh, and I think when, when I was hired, I, I want to say that there was 22,000 students uh, on campus at that time, 22, 23,000, something like that. So um, certainly a lot of growth that's taken place since then. Did you guys have a weight room? Did you, did you practice at the education gym and then play in the UCF arena? No, we we practiced in the um, in the arena. There was, you know, the upper stands <clears throat> could roll back and you have those courts, which are now the practice courts that they're using now. Yeah. Um, so we would we would practice there in in that facility. We didn't really use the education gym after I was hired. Um, but uh you know, so we just we had we we would split time with the women. We were either on the main court or on one of the upper practice courts. Coach, what was the recruiting like back in those days? Obviously, you didn't have much of a budget. But what was a typical recruiting trip for you guys? Well, I I, I recall that the, my first three years as a head coach, our recruiting budget was ten thousand dollars, and so we had to save that basically for official visits. Um, I remember I had. A, I had applied for the Stetson job at that same time that I got the UCF job and their recruiting budget was over $40,000. So we were 25% of what Stetson had uh, at that point in time. So, you know, we did a lot of obviously in-state recruiting and, and a lot of driving and driving on our own and, and paying for things on our own and trying to save that budget for a lot of official visits. Um, because we always felt that, you know, we wanted our recruiting base to be Florida, but at the same time, you know, we knew that the the state of Florida and certainly Orlando, uh, that we could attract some guys from the Midwest, from back east, you know, that type of thing. And so we tried to save um, save for official visits for those kids to be able to fly them in and have a good weekend visit. 
Well, you didn't really waste much time. Your first year on campus, you guys had a lot of success right away. And you were taking over a team. I think they went 10 and 17 the year before. What were your expectations coming in on your first year? I uh, just wanted them to to play hard and play together. I really didn't have any expectations on wins or losses. Um, you know, I think the last, uh, the three years previous to my hire, I think they won 10 games each and every year. Um, I think over their Division One history, they had averaged like eight wins a season. Um, so I knew it was going to be a tough job in regards to that. Uh, it was going to be tough in regards to I didn't recruit any of those uh, kids that were on the team. Um, and um, and also, they retained two of the assistant coaches, Ben DeVere and um, – and, uh, um, oh, boy, I've drawn a blank – Coach Evans. And, and Dwight um, – was uh there were tremendous guys and and so thankful to those guys that they kind of accepted me and really worked with me coming in the players were open-minded uh with what um what we were trying to do and implement um so it was not that we didn't have any challenges uh we certainly did with a new coach a new philosophy a kind of a new idea on what we wanted to do um but coach coach dean had really done a great job of um you know coaching that team up and um and they were really open minded to what we wanted to do and what we were trying to do well, they bought in right away because that team ended up going to the first ever uh NCAA tournament at UCF just talk talked about that season as a whole how magical it was and, and the run to the tournament well, it was a great run to the tournament, obviously. I'm sorry. <laughs> My dog's barking. Uh, I, I apologize for that. Yeah, uh, I'm just getting my wife to get the dog here. <laughs> no, worries. What's the dog's name, Coach? Barkley, which he's kind of barkling. Barkley After now, but... Uh, Charles Barkley? No, no, okay. no. That's That was... Uh, the kids and the wife picked, uh, picked the name. Uh, but uh, uh, it was... Uh, you know, we wanted to establish a, a team that was um, would work hard together. That would they'd be unselfish, they'd be in great shape. Um, they were going to play hard defensively, um, and uh, and that they would again be really unselfish. and And I really think we set a tone. and And I was a big big guy on the conditioning side of thing. Um, you know, we had uh, won a lot of games up at Pensacola Junior College to um and basically not with talent but with just being in better shape than everybody else and uh and we wanted to establish that toughness and that mindset by being in great shape great conditions so we could play um defense longer um and be connected uh through all of that so we established that in the in the fall when we went through our conditioning and strength and weight program and and uh and those guys bought in I, i'll give them all the credit in the world they they had uh had been successful in high school i mean each kid individually had come from good programs but they hadn't done it collectively at ucf and certainly trying to change that mindset and it's not an easy step to take um when you haven't won a lot as a program to finally win and be the first group uh to do that and you have to give the group that we had just all the credit in the world that they bought into what we were trying to do. Um, and they competed hard each and every day. They were a talented group of guys, not necessarily the biggest, but we, we had a group that competed and, and worked hard and, and, uh, and they played together and they, they sometimes had to take roles that were a little bit different for them. Some guys that maybe had started the year before I brought them off the bench um, so they, there was some adjustment on their part, but, uh, again, they were a good group to coach. <clears throat> coach, I want to talk about that 95, 96 team. It was a team that went 11 and 19 in the regular season. You had to replace a bunch of guys, Swaby, Saxton, Butts, Davis. They, they were all gone by that point in time. So kind of a younger team coming in, you go 11 and nine regular season, but you go on a magical run and you end up winning the conference tournament uh, in, I guess, maybe an upset. I'm not really sure who was favored over UCF and Mercer back in 1996, but you end up uh, pulling an upset and getting to the tournament. How special was that team? A team that 
again, by all accounts, probably didn't live up to what you would hope they would going to the season, but kind of pulled it together late and figured out a way to get into the tournament. We were really young, really young, really young guards, uh, really young team. Um, and it really took us a while to kind of get um, on the same page with one another. Um, we were a very good shooting team, and we really started to execute offensively. We got connected better defensively in the last part of February and March. Um, and, uh, and they caught fire towards the end. And, and we've always, especially the early days at UCF, when we were in the TAC and we were in the Atlantic Sun, in those conferences, we knew it would be exceptionally hard to um, get an at-large bid into the NCAA tournament. We knew almost everything we did relied on how we would play in the latter part of February and in March. So a lot of things and a lot of decisions that I made early on in the year in November, early December, uh, whether it be you know some of the things that we were running, what we were trying to get together defensively, uh, the people that we played, the people we tried to bring along during that time of the year is all pointing toward playing our best basketball in February and March. And I think we were pretty successful at being able to do that. And that's certainly that 95, 96 team uh, was one of those, uh, those teams that uh, just really started to play well uh, in the latter part of the season. In fact, uh, that was a team that, uh, you know, we played – UMass yep. with Marcus Camby and Travieso and I can't remember the other guard's name. They were number one, they were number one number seed. One they might've yeah. been number one in the country. They were, I'm yeah. pretty sure they were number one in the country at that time. And uh, we were playing them. And I remember Harry Kennedy, who is one of the best, you know, long range shooters that I'd ever coached. Uh, Harry Kennedy came down and, and uh, had a wide open three at the end of the first half to cut it to one. And uh, we were down four at the half and um, we ended up, you know, they came out and went on a 12 0 run at the beginning of the second half UMass did, but we ended up playing them closer in that game than anybody else did throughout the tournament run for them until they got to the final four. Um, so we were, we were playing awfully well at that, at the end of the year. Yeah. I lost that one 92 to 70. Uh, Harry Kennedy had 21 points in that game coach four threes. Yeah. Uh, I think the other guard you're talking about is Edgar Padilla. He had 15 for, for UMass. Yeah, but yeah. what's what's the mindset as a coach, right? Obviously, going into that game, you're the 16th seed. You're going to number one team in the nation, right? What do you tell the team before the game? What do, you, what do you say to the players? How do you kind of get them ready to play a game where, by all accounts, coach, everyone expects you just to get blown out. But obviously, you got competitors. You want to win the game. What's that pregame speech like? How do you get your team prepared for games like that? You just, uh, you know, you're preparing the best that you can. You put put together the best game plan that you can. And you just want to go um, lay it on the line. Just go out there and have fun with it and uh, play as hard as you can, play as effectively as you can. And uh, don't worry about mistakes. You know, you're going to make some mistakes. They're going to make some great plays. You know, if they make a great play, hey, let's get the ball in and let's go and and uh, and go at it. Uh, and I think that team, and I learned a lot, quite honestly, from that year, to from uh, our first year. You know, and when we went to the tournament um, and played uh, Purdue at in Lexington, Kentucky, the 93-94 team. And uh, I thought that team really played tight and tense. You know, I mean, we were playing a number one seed. We were playing, <clears throat> you know, Glenn Robinson, the big dog, and, and he was just so dominating. We didn't have anybody that could match up with him. But I, th I really thought we played tight and we didn't need to play tight we had nothing to lose but i thought the 96 team really came out and and played uh aggressive and played uh, like they had nothing to lose well the third time was almost a charm there because we gave pittsburgh everything they could handle the third time we went to the tournament I, what was it two minutes left we were down what four or six and then we dribble the ball off our foot out of bounds yeah and things kind of go downhill but talk about that whole night i thought that was uh Maybe our, as you mentioned, our best chance to maybe win a, a first round game. It was, um, and, and we were right. I think it was, we were down three or four when we had that turnover. And I thought we were just getting to the point in the game, the last couple minutes, where Pittsburgh would maybe start to tighten up. Uh, quite honestly, I think we were the 14th seed uh, yeah. that year. And, and I was kind of 
disappointed that because I really thought we were going to be a 13 seed. And I thought if we could play a four rather than a three, I thought that would be uh, an oper- a better opportunity for us. But uh, our Pittsburgh was really tough defensively. Jamie Dixon was a great coach, um, <clears throat> you know, and always played great defense and made it tough on you to score. But our guys scrapped and, and fought in that game. Uh, you know, certainly our 4 5 teams, you know, were, were some of our better, better basketball teams for sure. And we fought them tooth and nail right down to the wire. And, you know, a, a turnover here, a missed shot there uh, was a difference in that ball game. But our guys um, really competed hard for sure. Yeah, those two years you mentioned, we got you won 49 games in those two years. And a lot of good players on those teams, uh, Dexter Lyons and Josh Peppers and those guys. Tell us a little bit about those those players you had. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, Josh was a, a guy we got from Memphis and and um, was absolutely tremendous and and a great young man and and had a tremendous career. Uh, a lot of it in Japan, um, playing well uh, there, and and certainly um, Dexter Lyons. You know, I we got Dexter out of Daytona beach community college and just what an athlete and what a great personality. And, and, uh, you know, you, you, you remember that he would have his fro on home games and, and he would put it in cornrows when he went on the road. And, uh, if you remember the big controversy, I mean, everybody started to wear, um, uh, their fros at home. You know, and and uh, it really became a thing. And Dexter absolutely, absolutely loved that. And um, and he he just played into that that whole thing because it really started to be a thing in in the UCF arena. And um, <clears throat> and then after after uh, the season, you know, they the board of regents, um, you know, brought us into one of their meetings uh, on campus with Dr. Hitt and everything. And, um, you know, they, they pulled out their own Afros at the meeting after they were were honoring the team. And, you know, they put on Afros, the chairman of the board and, and Dr. Hitt and the team and Dexter just loved it like crazy. They were laughing like crazy and they were, they were enjoying themselves uh, for sure. And, and it turned into a big controversy because some professor on campus thought it was inappropriate uh, for them to do that. But I tell you, our team, our players, and Dexter in particular, absolutely loved it. And they ate it up and, and it had so much fun. But that was, you know, that was so fun for, this, for the student body, for, for the people in the, in the arena. You, you know, you guys remember that. and, and uh, you know, putting those froze on and stuff. And that, that's what college athletics is about to do some fun stuff like that. I don't think it was over the top at all. Yeah. Coach, talk about the student body for a second. Obviously, you know, you go to the tournament too. you know, two of your first three years had a stretch there where the team struggled from here and there. And then another two straight back-to-back appearances in, in 04 and 05. What was the fan support like, you know, what were you seeing? Were you seeing crowds kind of grow year over year over year? Were you certain to kind of see that, that build out, if you will, of sort of that, that diehard UCF basketball fan base? We did, you know, it, it certainly grew, um, you know, they had gone through, you know, so many years before we got there of not winning that first year, we won 21, uh, games and, and, uh, you know, had the tournament at home and, and, um, and won the tournament at home. Um, and that that started to change everything, you know, it certainly did. And, and we had great student bodies and, and uh, it continued to grow and it, it grew as, as people became students, then became grad students, you know, or even were young uh, professionals in Orlando and they'd come back to the games. And, and uh, you know, it was so much fun. And they started, you know, bringing all their signage and coming up with different chants and, and that type of thing. And, and certainly, you know, during those years and, you know, I think, um, you know, in the first 11 years that we were there in the TAC and the Atlantic Sun, uh, before we started moving to Conference USA, and then, of course, the American after that. But, um, you know, we, we had, we, I think we were in 11 conference tournaments. Uh, we were in the in championship game seven years out of those 11 years mm-hmm. in the championship game. So, you know, 
people knew that we were going to, if, if we were struggling early in the year, by the time we got to March, we'd be playing our best basketball and we would have a chance. And, and again, that's, that was by design and we wanted to be playing our best because we had to win three games in three nights, you know, um, and, and win the conference tournament to get into the NCAA tournament. And we were in seven, seven championship games. We won four of those, wish we would have won five or six. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I think that just kept building, you know, as far as the fan support, um, and, and of course the, you know, just so many good boosters and, and loyal boosters all through those growing years. Cause it, it was a tough growing process, you know, it was not easy. And, um, you know, whether it was, you know, budgetary issues here or something happened there or an injury here, or there, um, you know, there's certain things that happen to all programs and it's, it's hard to, to develop that winning mentality. Then you have that expectation that, that you're going to win and be playing well. And, and, um, but, you know, there was a growth process from an educational standpoint at UCF. And certainly there was a growth process athletically, you know, and, and in all sports, we all, faced a lot of the same problems, um, you know, most of it budgetary, you know, limitations, you know, and we were going through that time of growth and Steve Sloan did a tremendous job. He's one of the best athletic directors that, that I've ever been around and ever worked with. And he understood what coaches go through, what teams go through and the growth process and how you have to build things. And, and um, but he was under direction that, that he had to balance the budget. You know, and so he couldn't go out there and, and make a lot of changes just because we were so tight in what we, we had to work with uh, budgetarily, you know, and then that started to uh, change. And I can't remember what year, but I know that they started to put in um, in in the um, tuition, a little athletic uh, sure. uh, benefit. And as the student body grew, then that pool of money based on on your hours that you were taking started to grow and certainly that helped all athletic programs what was your take on kirk's jerks obviously there was a, a legendary <laughs> section a lot of chance i went i remember when mike and i were there and someone got ejected you know left right left right as they walked off the court there was the free throw chant right where this now i think they call it the the stomp stop clap clap whoosh clant now but that, yeah. that that actually started when when you were there what did you make of sort of the, the kirk's jerks phenomenon Oh, uh, they were, they were awesome. They were awesome. They were great. They started, you know, selling their t-shirts, Kirk Jerks t-shirts and stuff. And everybody started wearing those things and yelling Kirk, 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 as you come out on the court and, and, um, you know, they, and they had all their different chants that, that they had throughout the game. And, and, uh, yeah, that was, that was all in great fun. You know, you love that at home court advantage and, and they would give, you know, other coaches a tough time. I remember when Stetson come over, they love Stetson at, at our place and, <laughs> and, and getting after their coach and coaches and stuff like that. And, but they, they really started a great tradition. They really did with, with their Kirk Kirk chants and, and um, you know, just, just everything that they did. And, and um, you know, the funniest one I, I think was, and I, I enjoyed it. I don't know if anybody <laughs> else did, but, if we had the game one, they started going good coach, bad coach, good coach, bad <laughs> coach, back and forth. And their, their ingenuity was, was infectious, you know, and they, they were, they were outstanding. We loved it. Did you ever manage to score one of those Kirk's jerks t-shirts? I, they did send me one. Yep. I still got okay. one. I okay. still got one. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> you mentioned the first dozen years we played in the TAC and we played in the uh, A Sun, and then we moved to conference USA. What were the biggest differences once we changed conferences that time? Well, the whole level of competition just elevated tremendously. I, when we were in the A Sun, I think the A Sun was ranked 22nd best conference in the country, and Conference USA was ninth. So that's not a little jump. That's a huge jump. Huge jump. And, um, you know, you got Houston, you've got Memphis, you know. You know, right on down the line at that point in time, Tulsa was r really good. And, um, you know, just UAB, um, it, it was a really well-coached conference. And, uh, 
you know, and of course you got John Calipari who he was coaching UMass when we met them in 96. So John and I go back a little bit. And one of the first, that first summer that we were moving into the, um, into conference USA, I was recruiting a kid, um, in a summer workout up in Memphis. So I flew into Memphis and rental car, they gave me a minivan. So I'm driving a minivan recruiting, going to this high school to see this kid, uh, you know, and, uh, he was about a six, five, four man, you know, somebody that we had a chance to maybe get. Um, and as I'm pulling in, who pulls in nose to nose on the other other parking spot right in front of me is a Porsche and John Calipari's <laughs> climbing out of his Porsche while I'm climbing out of my minivan, you know, and he's going in there to recruit, you know, a, a, a top 20 player in the country. And I'm recruiting this six, five kid that's, you know, we got a chance to win. So the ability to recruit at that level, the first few years was it was a huge difference in what those guys were recruiting and what we were able to recruit, but we were successful. I, I think our first three years, uh, our first year in conference USA, I think we finished fifth. Then I think we finished second or third, the next two years. I mean, so we, we went at it, you know, we went at it, we competed hard those first few years uh, in that league. And, and um, you know, it, but it was a huge challenge. It was a huge change um in in the competition level but we fought our tails off in the first couple of years we're still playing in the old arena but in 2007 yeah. they opened the, the new arena how did that help and change the state of the program for you well it changed everything from a recruiting standpoint you know it was really hard to recruit kids um into you know basically a high school gym you know with a garage door on one end you know <laughs> and you know you got Joey Dorsey from Memphis, you know, dunking the living daylights out of that basket in front of the garage door, you know, and you see on ESPN, you know, that he's doing that and there's a garage door behind. But so it was really tough to recruit to to the UCF arena. But the new arena, you know, that that really changed everything because it it was um, well designed. You know, I, I thought they did a tremendous job of putting all of that together and creating that environment around the arena, you know, with the retail areas, with the dormitories, um, you know, and, and you're having 2000 students that have to walk out of their room and walk across the street and, and come to a game. And so, um, that really helped the attendance. Um, you know, Jimmy Skiles really got some things going there to get those students involved. And we had great student support and, and, uh, those kids were active in that change over to the new arena. But, uh, yeah, that really helped everything in, in what we were doing on the recruiting side of things. No question. Coach, one of the most famous recruits you had was Jermaine Taylor, who went on obviously to, to have a nice little NBA career as well. Take us back to Jermaine Taylor's recruiting. How did how did you get him to UCF? What was that sell like? And when you saw him immediately, did you know this is a guy that I need to have wearing the black and gold? Yeah, we we knew that that this if we could get this this young man from Tavares, you know, if we could get him, he was going to be something really special for us. And and uh, he was a little bit. Uh, from a national standpoint, you know, he was a little under the radar on things. I, I know he had a couple other um, uh, one or two high major schools, uh, but we worked him hard for a couple of years, two, three years, and, uh, you know, developed a great relationship with him. Um, you know, and he's, uh, you know, we've, we stay in touch a little bit and, and he's been awesome. Uh, I ran so many things and designed so many things that take advantage of his abilities you know from a standpoint of his athleticism his ability to be a shot maker um certainly he turned out to be i want to say the 32nd draft in the um you know picking the draft uh, i remember and, and i've always thought the best teacher of the game of basketball is watching film mm -hmm. so i would always break down you know things that i saw that our players were doing either correct positive things or things that they needed to get better at. Obviously, there's more things they need to get better at than than the positive side of things. And I remember on, you know, especially a later part of his freshman year and early part of his sophomore year, 
and I'd have individual clips that I would bring the players in and sit down with me. And I'm talking to Jermaine and Jermaine, good job here. Good job there. But why'd you take this shot here, Jermaine? This guy's, you know, he's almost in your face. He almost blocked a shot. Why, why are you shooting that? You know, you should shot fake and drive him or whatever. And, and finally, you know, after a couple of times of showing him those clips, I said, what, what are you seeing here? Coach, coach, honestly, I didn't even see the guy, you know, and, and the guy's in his face. He says, coach, I didn't even know he was there. And that, that was the kind of focus that he had in shooting the basketball. Cause he's one of the best um, tough shot makers that I've ever coached. And, and it, he had such confidence in his ability to make those shots Certainly, at that, his athleticism and his high release allowed him to to shoot some contested shots that that other guys wouldn't be able to get away with. But it really stuck with me, and I've pointed that out to a lot of other shooters that that kind of had that same mentality, had such confidence and belief in their ability to make shots. Um, they really didn't care how close that guy was flying at him. Um, they were just locked in on that that basket and um and had the confidence to make that shot even even highly contested and that's that's something that really stuck with me and and after he said that like especially his junior and senior year i didn't worry about it as much because it didn't bother him you know that guy flying at him and and we really designed some things that hey we want you to shoot this shot no matter how contested you are you know especially later in the shot clock and stuff but he was a he was a tremendous player and and a great teammate and he's so appreciative too you know and it's it's funny how you you um, you know you're you're coaching your team on the basketball court but you're also coaching your team as a part of life and it's interesting as these you know as as I've been through it for forty three years you know the things that stick with some of your players years later you know, that you get in a conversation with them. Hey, coach, you remember you told me such and such, you know, and I have really put that, you know, to good use. Like in Jermaine's case, you know, I always told him, I said, listen, you, you got to handle your own money. You got to know what's going on with your money. Don't rely on somebody else managing your money for you. They can, they can help you with it, but you have to know what, you know, what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, that's something that he's taken to heart and, and, and others too. But, you know, it's, it's interesting what sticks with those guys years later. It's also funny, probably a commentary on where basketball is today. I was looking up his stats. His freshman year, he played 11 minutes. Uh, and yeah. in today's college basketball, you're highly recruited freshman. If you're playing 11 minutes, they're in the portal before before yeah. Thanksgiving hits. But another uh, famous recruit I want to talk about with you is Marcus Jordan. Obviously, you know, didn't have maybe the on-court career that a guy like Jermaine Taylor had, but uh, his last time obviously being Jordan. I'd love to hear that recruitment story and sort of how, how you how you approached Marcus. And obviously, you know, his, his family is pretty, uh, uh, pretty knowledgeable on this basketball stuff. How, how did that recruitment process go for you? Um, interesting to say the least, uh, very interesting. Um, and, and we, we had identified AJ Rumsa yep. the year before, and they were high school teammates and AAU teammates and that type of thing. And AJ's, AJ's one of those guys with, uh, such a tremendous personality and, and just a, a tough nut. I mean, I mean, just play his heart out each and every day. Um, and and he came as a freshman um and we also identified marcus as this is a guy that we need we needed at that time we needed a really tough guard a powerful guard a guard that could get in the paint make some things happen in the paint um and we didn't have that identity in that position and we identified marcus as somebody that you know would be really good for us and um and it, we worked through aj aj hey you know we're interested in recruiting yeah i'm talking to him about ucf coach he's really interested and and our assistant coach mike jeskulski was one that did a lot of the work there and and um, we had some early conversations with marcus later in his junior year of high school and had been up to see him a little bit and and um and certainly communicated during the summer 
communicated with his mother, Juanita. And um, I didn't really um, talk with Michael um, at all early on in it because he was living with Juanita. And, and uh, so we just kind of worked through her. And uh, it came to a point where his senior year, we couldn't get a hold of him. I couldn't get a hold of him. And we really never talked. I talked to him in like September um, and really didn't talk to him the rest of the year. And I keep saying to AJ, AJ, what's the deal? Does he have any interest in us uh, or not? You know, and and I knew that just because of the finan family dynamic and everything that, you know, they were being very cautious and very quiet on things. Um, so that didn't bother me at all. And um, but he was also being recruited by everybody. You know, I mean, it, it was a wide range of level of schools. He was recruited by high majors, but he was also being recruited by, you know, low majors. And um, because, as you say, he was Michael Jordan's son, but he wasn't like putting up huge numbers and that type of thing. He didn't have that kind of high profile recruiting profile. Um, but I thought he was great for us anyway. So we, we went through the whole season and we we're getting to the end of the season. I went up to see him and another player, quite honestly, um, when they were playing, um, I don't know if it was their district championship or whatever in Chicago. And, um, it was, it was the game that actually they needed to win to go to the state tournament. And we finally got a little more conversation going on after we were up there on that weekend. And they went to um, the state tournament the next week. And again, just a little bit of conversation started to flow. I'm thinking, wow. And AJ kept saying, coach, he's really interested. Well, they won the state championship. And the Tuesday after the state championship, Juanita calls me. And she says, we'd like to come and visit on an official visit on Thursday. This is Tuesday. I'm thinking, awesome. That's great. We're, let us check on some flight reservations and, and get back to you with a little bit of an itinerary on flights and that type of thing. And we'll bring you in on Thursday, you know, get you out, um, you know, Sunday morning, Thursday night, we would bring them in. And the visit wouldn't start until um, Friday morning anyway. Uh, and she said, Oh, don't worry about flights. We'll, we'll fly down, you know? So <laughs> she said, and you know, so they were flying into Sanford airport on their private jet. And, uh, so we're there executive airport waiting for him to come off the plane. And, you know, as a coach, you know, you're keeping calm and cool and collected. I wanted to walk on that plane so bad. <laughs> to go see what that plane looked like. <laughs> but I just played it cool. And, uh, you know, we had a great weekend visit. And, um, you know, there was, there was, uh, she asked me, Juanita asked me, uh, we, we, she had Marcus stay up in the room for about 45 minutes. So she and I could just talk on Sunday morning and uh, about some things that were really important to her. And um, and the family. And at that point, I thought, geez, she's getting some serious questions. We might have a chance at this. And um, and she was awesome. She was great to work with and communicate with. And so that was visit. And I want to say like a week after that or two weeks after that, after that great visit. Uh, and that was the only official visit that Marcus took being recruited by almost everybody in the country, took one official visit and they were on their way. He called me from the tarmac like 10 days later and uh, they were going on spring break down to the Bahamas. And he says, I'm coming to UCF. So probably the one of the most high pro profile guys we've ever recruited at UCF. It all happened in like two weeks, two and a half weeks. It was, it was really amazing, but, uh, and he came in, he was the, just what I thought he would be a tough, hard nosed, gritty defender, smart player. Uh, not, not the greatest score, but he affected the game in a very positive way, you know, and then it was nice to, you know, 
talk with Michael Jordan, you know, at the very end of it all and, and make sure he didn't have any questions. And of course, um, that was unique having him come on campus and, you know, all the things that you had to do and, and talk through and, and he would never let you know that he was coming until kind of the last minute because he didn't want, you know, he, he wanted to try to be low key and not be a, you know, a distraction to everything. But, uh, um, so it, 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 there's a lot of stories there. And of course, all that became a controversy with Adidas. And I was going to, I was going to ask Nike. that. Yeah. That obviously well, became I, a story I, later. I told Were you a part of that early conversation with the shoes? Oh, I was a part of that whole thing. And, um, I had talked to our representative from, from, um, Adidas. Cause we were in Adidas school at that time. And I talked to him like, his junior year, that spring of the junior year, uh, I said, Hey, we've got an opportunity. We've got a little bit of a connection here in recruiting Michael Jordan's son. I said, he's not going to wear Adidas. Are you going to have a problem with that? You know, cause if, if you guys have a problem with that, I, I can't recruit him. You know, I just, I just can't recruit him. And they said, no, no, you, you go recruit who you need to recruit. Don't, don't worry about that. And so through the process, I'd asked them that question, the Adidas people, that question a couple of different times. And especially when it started to heat up, you know, in the spring again, in fact, I might've called him that day when he wanted to come in on an official visit. I think I called Adidas at that time. I said, Hey, now understand he's coming on an official visit. He's not going to wear Adidas. And I never talked to, I never talked to Marcus at all about shoes, what he would wear, what he wouldn't wear. I never, I just knew from, you know, Michael's standpoint, it, there, there were going to be a Nike shoe and, uh, or a Nike family. Um, and they said, Adidas said, no, go ahead, recruit who you need to recruit. So we did that and signed them. I even asked him before we signed him. I asked him again. No, we're good. We'll work something out. Don't worry. We'll work something out. So I get a call the week of playing our first exhibition game when Marcus is on the team. And they said, and I had talked to Michael. Let me back up. Let me, I had talked to Michael then after he signed. I had talked to Michael. I said, Michael, what are we, how can we work through this shoe thing here? Um, you know, we're going to be in Adidas uniforms and warm ups and socks and, you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, what are we going to do with shoes? And he says, he says, this is what we'll do, coach. This is what we'll do. We're going to make an all white shoe um, with, with, he, he originally said no swoosh on it. And an all black shoe with no swoosh on it. We'll make those shoes and he can wear those. It'll be non nondescript. I thought, wow, that'd be great. Well, I, as it turned out, they couldn't make it without the swoosh, but they would make an all white shoe with a black swoosh and he'd make an all black shoe with a white swoosh. And Marcus would take a uh, marker and he'd mark out the swoosh. So it looked like an all white shoe or it looked like an all black shoe. And that's what Michael determined that we were gonna do. And Marcus did that, he did that. And unless you were really close up on it, you couldn't tell. Now Marcus was, he had Adidas socks on, he had Adidas shorts on, he had Adidas uniform on, Adidas warm up. Everything else that he wore was Adidas but not the shoes. Well, Adidas calls me um, the week of and says, Marcus has to, has to wear Adidas shoes. I said, I talked to you guys about this ad nauseum. Well, it wasn't our local people. It wasn't uh, Adidas America people. It was the people in Germany that, that were the stumbling blocks to that. So, they canceled the school contract at the end of the year, you know? And so I'm thinking, Oh boy, that's, you know, we, we're not, we're not it's not just basketball. It's, it's all sports, you know? And, um, 
And I talked to Michael right away. I said, Michael, he says, don't worry about it, coach. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it. We'll get something done. And nothing happened. Uh, you know, and I had talked to other people at Nike too. And, uh, and they, they weren't coming through with the school contract. And I said, Michael, I said, what's going on here? You know, we gotta, we gotta get something done. Don't worry about it, coach. We'll, we'll take care of it. Well, what, what ended up happening were the Jordan brand, you know, so that ended up pretty good for UCF. <laughs> I'd say so. So did he get off that private jet and go on to, into your minivan <laughs> that day when you were <laughs> I didn't have a minivan then. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's, I did not have a minivan at that point. All right. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, coach. I'm going to ask you to give me, using all the players you had from 93 oh. to 210, give me a starting five. Of who can't do that. No, I can't <laughs> do that. There were a lot of great ones. There were a lot of great players, um, you know, in each, you know, each league that we kept going to, you, you were able to recruit better players. It just took you a time, you know, to get to the level of the top teams in the, in the league. Um, but uh, it, um, there were so many great ones, you know, I, our first year with, Victor Saxton and Oak Hill Swaby and, um, you know, Patrick Butts and Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis, what a good teammate and a good player. I mean, that whole first year that we were there and and uh, and the people that sacrificed uh, with things uh, to make that happen. You had mentioned Jermaine Taylor and there's so many. I, I Peppers, um, uh, you know, Mike O'Donnell, you know, there, there's so many people. I, I just be leaving them out if, if I, you know, I'd, I'd forget too many of them. All right, let me ask you this then: Which of your players made your job easier for you? Who, who were the guys that were there? That were the real leaders on the team in the locker room and kind of help, help you deal with the other players? Well, I, I'll tell you what. One of the guys that really helped change things around and change the culture and change um, the mentality about winning and stuff was James Walker on our first team, you know, and uh, he wasn't the, you know, he's a six, six post guy, six, six post guy and just hard nosed, tough battle those bigs. And um, you know, he, uh, he really, kept guys in line, you know, he kept guys in line and, uh, you know, competed so hard against, you know, being outsized, um, all the time, you know, Victor Saxon was really good, but you know, all, there's so many good leaders throughout the years. Uh, you know, I, I think I mentioned Mike O'Donnell. I, one thing about Mike O'Donnell, he was a tough, tough dude, you know, tough dude. And we got him from NC state and, and I, and I loved him before he ever went to NC State and tried to get him. But uh, but when he came back and and what people don't realize that that man he was hurting a, as a player. I mean physically, and he would battle through things like you wouldn't believe. Um, you know, with his knees and stuff, he had sore knees, and he he wouldn't miss a practice, he wouldn't miss a game, and he was hurting. Um, but he was such a tough nut and such a good leader. And, um, but there, there are so many good leaders th throughout the, the time period that we were here. Well, coach, unfortunately, sometimes all good stories come to an end. You spent <laughs> 17 years at UCF and obviously 2010, the news comes down that, uh, that you're going to be leaving UCF, UCF. Obviously I'm sure those conversations are, are private and things you want to protect. And, uh, Keith Tribble was the AD at that point in time. So not the AD who brought you into UCF. What was it like the, the day you, you found out you'd be leaving UCF? Not fun. Not good, but we were able to um, raise our family for 17 years there in Orlando in a great community and made so many great friends 
uh, and relationships with the with the boosters, with the academic side of, of campus, and and uh, you know people that we worked on it with on a daily basis, and and just appreciative of of all those years and. And, uh, you know, we worked our tails off, you know, and I appreciate all my coaches and assistant coaches and and all the players and managers and trainers and, you know, all those people that that worked as hard as 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 anyone uh, to make a program, you know, establish a program that uh, wasn't having much going for it before we came and. Um, it was a it was a tough growth process, and and you'll get that answer from anybody that was coaching, you know, at UCF through that that period of time. And um, you know, it's uh, it it was fun. It was awesome. Um, it was working with great people uh, day in and day out. And uh, you know, we just look at the positives on all of that, and um, we certainly enjoyed our time. Then you went on to, to spend some uh, the rest of your career at, at Iowa, but did, were you able to keep an eye on UCF? Obviously, they went through a couple of coaches after you. Johnny Dawkins now there, moving to the Big 12. Have you been able to keep an eye on UCF basketball, even though I know you've been uh, probably pretty busy with your full-time job at Iowa? Well, we do. And, you know, I had two sons on the team, you know, yeah. in, in 2010. And and certainly those guys uh, developed great friendships uh, with the other team members and and uh, Drew and Dustin, they both uh, stay in touch with a lot of those guys, and and uh, and uh, you know, I, I hear a lot from from those guys that, that I coached at different points in times, and and um, you know, you you think of guys like Tony Marlowe always stays in touch, and Taylor Young, and you know, Mike O'Donnell, and all those guys. But um, there were so many great players, and and great fans, and great friendships, and long time long time boosters, you know, that, that have seen it all, you know, from division two, you know, through the tough young years, through the transition years to being able to be in the big 12. Now, I mean, that, that was the vision all along, you know, to get to that point in time. And, and, um, there's a lot of, a lot of steps you have to go through and we all wanted it to happen faster than maybe it did, but, um, you can't you can't rush uh, quality all the time. It takes time to grow. So, um, but it was it's it's been great to to have those relationships and stay in touch with a lot of those people. Coach, today college basketball and college sports altogether is a lot different now with the transfer portal and NIL and all that stuff. But there were still transfers back then too. The one that I always think about, obviously, the Graham brothers we had here, and then they end up going to Oklahoma State. What was the whole process? What did they say to you when they told you they were leaving? And what did you try to do to get them to stay? Well, to talk them out of it, um, they uh, we recruited them really hard for two years um, prior to them coming. We were the only university in the country to offer both of them. A lot of people offered Joey, but they didn't offer Stevie. And, um, and we had a lot of, of, um, conversations and I thought they had tremendous talent and ability and they worked so hard. They really worked hard <clears throat> and, um, and their dad was, you know, coaching them up and, and, uh, but we, we got them to commit, got them to come and we invested two really long years with them. And, uh, we started them right from the beginning. Um, and, uh, you know, we played them right away and we played them through their mistakes and uh, a lot of mistakes defensively and and uh, some on the offensive end. But they were tremendous, tremendous kids and tremendous teammates. They just wanted to win. They were so talented and they were just coming into their own. Um, and I was walk. I was opening the door to walk up to work them out before the last workout before the final four and um, dad and family were on the other side of the door opening up my office door to come in and tell us that they were um, going to transfer and um, it was a hard conversation a disappointing conversation um, the boys loved it at UCF they really liked it at UCF um, but they wanted they wanted something else. Um, 
one of the interesting reasons see i started stevie at the three spot and i started um uh joey at the four but he played a lot of three um and one of their complaints one of dad's complaints was that joey was playing the at the four i said yeah he's he's probably playing 20 minutes at the four, but he's playing 10, 12 minutes at the three, you know, and, and as we move forward and we, we get some other people with size, um, you know, that we'll, we'll play him more on the wing, uh, cause he thinks where he needed to be for an NBA career. So they go to Oklahoma state and played two years and were very good, very successful and had a great career at, at, um, at Oklahoma state. Where did Joey play? Joey played at the four, you know, for two years there. So, um, but it, it, I don't, they, they were great kids. They, they really liked it at UCF. Um, and, uh, but that quite honestly, that really put us, um, you lose two players like that together, you know, that's a hard void to fill. And we had to fill it with some junior college kids and, and, um, that that really made it tough on us for a few years there. If I had told you in 1993 that UCF one day was going to be in the Big 12, we were going to be hosting Kansas, beating them at home, what would you have said to me back then? Um, that would be hard to believe playing in uh, the UCF arena um, with the garage door on the end, and uh, that that would be um, pretty insightful looking into the future that far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had a huge part in building that thing, Coach, so we're very grateful for that. No, it was fun. We had a great time. All right, Coach, before we get out of here with any interview, we appreciate your time tonight. We'd like to kind of do some random rapid-fire questions. This could oh, be boy. music, movies, sports, no. <laughs> any, anything under the sun, Coach. So here's my first one for you, and apologies, I did not ask this sooner. Uh, on your first ever team at UCF, that 93-94 team, can you give me the scouting report on a pesky 6'3 guard named Darren Hinshaw, please? I'll tell you what. We were really lucky. You talk about leadership, okay? You talk about leadership because he played um, after the football season. He was quarterback there at UCF. He wanted to come out for basketball. And, um, you know, I didn't. I just getting on campus. I just starting to learn everybody. And and he walked on on our basketball team and i tell you what he was terrific now it took him about a month to get in any kind of shape because you know football players are nowhere near the shape of <laughs> basketball players um but he was competitive he was smart he was tough and he was a very good leader in the locker room on the bench um he was a part of of having that success you know and and he was terrific the other thing about that and you we didn't really talk that much about that team, but one of my funny stories, you, you'll love this. Um, Dan Hipster was the coach at, at uh, Stetson. That Stetson's who we played in the championship game at the UCF arena to go to the NCAA tournament. Uh, and so we win the game and there was a space between the last chair of the bench and the scores table. Okay. And so I'm walking down in front of the scores table to shake hands with Dan Hipsher and the, and the Stetson team. And of course our players and everybody there on the court. And, and of course all the student body is running out on, on the court like crazy. Well, Dan, sometime during the game, he had taken his coat off, which he normally does. His court coat was sitting, his sport coat was sitting on the floor in that space between the chair and the scorer's table. And there was student after student after student running onto the court through that space and stepping on his sport coat as they go, you know? And one student went through, two students went through, the third student that went through, Dan Hipsher nailed him with the forearm <laughs> and knocked him flat on his butt, you know, and picked up his coat and then shook hands with me. I don't know who that student was, but uh he took a shot for sure but uh that that was that was fun i i love the students being out on the court that was awesome what's the best basketball movie of all time hoosiers i knew you were gonna say hoosiers the correct answer is white men can't jump i'm sorry <laughs> okay i i i 
can't argue with that. That's a good one. Coach, when you were uh, at the basketball program there, you overlap with uh, a few different football coaches, namely Mike Kruzek and George O'Leary. Mike Kruzek was famously an NFL quarterback, big, strong guy, looked like he could still lace him up and, and get out there and play a little bit. George was a little bit a little bit grumpy. Which one of those two scared you more, Mike Kruzek or George O'Leary? <laughs> well, physically, Cruz did. You know, <laughs> he was so strong, you know, and what a what a talented offensive mind. Yeah. you know, that Mike had, I mean, he was tremendous in designing things and, and, um, you know, putting concepts together. And I mean, they were exciting football team when he was there. And then George came in and we had a great relationship with George, you know, he was, he was terrific. And like I, you, we talked about Marcus Jordan on the visit. We, we, you know, we went over and talked to George and talked about football and stuff. He was always accommodating and helped us in any way he could. He knew how to run a program. You know, and he he was demanding on some things uh, facility wise and and throughout everything. Um, and but he UCF needed that mentality for football at that point in time um, to get those things done. And, um, you know, you got to give him a lot of credit for what he established. Speaking of Cruz, did you ever call him up and ask him if you could borrow Dante for a couple of seasons? Well, well, I was a part of the recruiting for Dante. Dante was supposed to come out for basketball hmm. in the recruiting process. He wanted to play both. And, and um, he was a terrific basketball player, very smart, obviously physical, uh, that type of thing. But he wanted to play both. Well, if you recall his freshman year, I, I think he very first game, he either completed his first, I think it was his first 12 or 13 passes in a row, something like yeah. that, you know, and it was not just the passes he completed. There were every type of pass, you know, hook patterns over the middle, you know, crossing patterns, deep fly patterns. I mean, it was every kind of ball that you could throw. He threw in the first 12 passes of his collegiate career and completed all of them. And, um, I knew at that point in time, I said, well, he ain't coming out for basketball. That's, <laughs> that's over with. But we, we talked to Dante quite a bit. And on his visit, we were talking basketball with him. He was supposed to come out, but we well, knew he wouldn't. Shooting guard, small forward. Where would you have seen Dante? He'd be like a small forward. He'd be a small forward, power, un undersized power forward. You know, because what was he? He was 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, yeah. um, you know. But he was skilled. He was a really good passer, really good touch, great hands. Um, yeah, he had a great feel for the game. Besides basketball, what's your next favorite sport? Well, I was a baseball player as well. Um, and, uh, in fact, I played basketball, and I played one year of baseball at Iowa when I went to Iowa. So my dad was a baseball coach. My grandfather was a minor league baseball player and manager. Um, in fact, he managed the Cedar Rapids Bunnies for a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, baseball was always that, but I'm a, I'm a golf fanatic now. So play a little golf, not very well, but. <laughs> well, what's your does. baseball team growing up? What was your team? You know, I liked a lot of them, you know, I mean, we were close to when I grew up in Sioux city, Iowa, you know, Kansas city was always close, you know, the cubbies, you know, Iowa people love the Cubbies. So, but I, I didn't lock into like one team. I, I just appreciated the skill level, a lot of different people. Coach, I found a, a YouTube video from way, way back in the day when you're at UCF and you're fired up after a win. And uh, you invite all of your players to come up to the front of the room and they all sort of jump and chest bump you. Uh, a, was that something you did often? And B, did you ever regret <laughs> inviting some of those guys to come up and uh, jump and give you a chest bump? Well, I disagree with you that I invited them to do that. I, <laughs> okay. It, it was their idea. They forced it on me, you know, okay. and I just accommodate, I accommodated <laughs> them. That all started quite honestly. Um, when we had a huge win at UTEP early on, I think it was uh, the first year we were in that league and, and playing UTEP or maybe, maybe it was a non-conference game. I can't remember. Anyway, we, we had gone through a couple of tough weeks and, you know, UTEP had a really good team and we upset them uh, at UTEP and we came in the locker room and it was one chest bump after the other. And that's where it all started. But yeah, any big victory, um, you know, that they would, they would just start 
start it. And so then I, I, I came up, I said, okay, I know the games that they would want to chest bump me. So I would come in the locker room and say, okay, who wants some, you know, and we start chest bumping and stuff. Probably the one time I, I didn't really regret it, but it was a little bit funny. We had a player, um, uh, seven, three kid, Yakub Kuzmeric, who is about 300 and pounds with being seven, three or four, whatever he was. He got me pretty good, you know, and it fell back against the back, the wall and the, and the chalkboard and everything else banged my head. He nailed me pretty good. I wasn't quite ready for the extra 60 pounds that he had on everybody else. I think that made me 2007 coach. You guys won at UTEP 67, 64. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds right. Yep. All right. You got a little more time on your hands now. What's a vacation destination you you've always wanted to do, or you got something planned? Well, we are, we're, we're going to Hawaii. My wife hadn't been to Hawaii. I'd taken a couple teams out there, but go to Hawaii. We'll go overseas to some places, but there's so many great places in, in the United States that we're going to travel around and see. And we've been able to do that a little bit in the last year, but that's moving forward. We're going to, we're going to hit a lot of those destinations. My, my family's from Wales. So hopefully this summer we'll be able to go over to Wales and Scotland and some of those areas in England. So, but yeah, we're going to do, do a lot of traveling and go see the grandkids. Coach, I don't want to date myself, but I grew up watching NBA basketball. It was Pistons, Bulls. It was the Jordan Rules. It was, you know, Bird and, and Magic fighting each other. Then it, it was the Heat, Knicks, and Alonzo Mourning. It was tough physical basketball. When you watch basketball today, what do you think of the product you see in the NBA? Oh, you, you just have to admire the skill level and the, and the ability and agility that these guys have. And the way that they can handle the ball, the way they can shoot the ball, you know, everybody wants to compare, you know, this player versus that player. And, and you, I think you have to look at eras because the, the game has changed over the years and the dominant players, you know, you know, whether it be a Bill Russell, a Wilt Chamberlain, you know, are different than the big players of today and the skill level of today. Um, you just have to admire it. Now, I, I don't like the fact that it turns into such a one-on-one -on -one individual game in the NBA, and it's always been that way. Sure. But if I was a coach in the NBA, I'd probably be doing the same thing. I'd put the ball in the hands of the best ball handler or best shooter that I had and let them go to work because they're so talented, so skilled, you know, why complicate it with a bunch of movement and stuff like that, you know, but it, it, basketball in general, and it's come into college too. It's, it's so ball screen dominated now. I get it. I understand it. That's not necessarily the style of play that I grew up with or coached. Um, but you, you just have to admire their ability and their agility and their strength and length. People don't understand how long those guys are. You know, each level that you go up, you know, whether it's Division Two, II, Division Three, Division One, low Division One to mid Division One to high major Division One to the NBA, each step, guys are so much bigger, so much stronger, more athletic, longer. Um, it's it's just amazing what those guys can do nowadays. Who's your favorite musical artist? So when you're cruising around in that minivan, what are you blaring up? <laughs> I I I've told my players for years that, that if they're not listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire, then they don't they don't have any musical taste. Earth, Wind, and Fire is is my my jam. What's what's that's the too, song, that's coach? too old school. That's, too old school for you guys. That well, doesn't I, I, matter. Any, anything they play in, anything that they play. September, that's the way of the September, world. I was gonna anything. Say, September is a, is, is a classic one, Coach. Yeah. What was your go-to uh, spot around UCF campus if you wanted a good meal? You're hungry, you want, a good, you want a good lunch or dinner. Where were you going around campus to go, get a good meal? Boy, has that changed over the years. <laughs> yes. There, were, there weren't that many options, you know, early on. Um, but. Um, you know, I, I, there are so many great restaurants and, and great places, but maybe one just on campus, uh, you know, people that know the campus would know of Huey Magoo's. 
Sure. You know, oh, I yeah. go to Big human Huey goose yeah. when they when they started out, you know, I kind of got got into Huey's. So that's something local right there on campus that is pretty good. Did you ever hit wackadoos or locos, whatever it was called there in the student union? You know, I I don't know that I hit that very often when I was you, there. You didn't I didn't go to yeah. I didn't I didn't go to the student union all that much. I was in the office on the court. You've gotten to see a lot of the country traveling for basketball. What's a city that you're glad you never have to go back to? Oh my. <laughs> I don't know that there's you know, when when I'm traveling as uh, with a team with basketball, I don't get to see the cities. You know, you 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 fly in, you bus to your hotel, you go to your room, you go to the team room, you know, you get back on the bus, you go to the arena, you come back to the hotel, and you get back on the plane. I don't even get to see the cities. So I've been to a lot of them, but I don't know that I, there's any of them that I wouldn't go back to. You haven't been? Coach, did you go to Lubbock? Did you ever have to go play in Lubbock? Texas? I have never been to Lubbock. Nope. I haven't that been there. Be your answer. <laughs> that, that, would, that would have been a good one coach i'm not sure if my math is right at this uh this overlap hey, i've been not, to but... now, i've been to like Bowie's creek now you know it's not like i haven't been to some places <laughs> we, 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 we go we go busting in from the hotel because it, it had no hotels in Bowie's creek you had to stay you know 30 45 minutes away so we're busting in it's a it's a rainstorm it's raining hard and Bowie's creek had the smallest gym in division one basketball you know, at the time. And it, it was an old, old building that sat like 500, 600, I don't know, something like that. So we're pulling into the parking lot right when a lightning strike hits the back uh, transformer on the building and fire starts running up the wires toward the building, you know, and, and I'm thinking, okay, there's no way we're playing this game, you know, and they put us in the student union and by gosh, I, we started calling around high schools. Where can we play this game? We play it tonight, play it tomorrow. By 10 o'clock that night, the, the electrical company had come out and they had fixed everything. And we started a game at like 10 o'clock at night, but Bowie's Creek, there's not much going on in Bowie's Creek, <laughs> North Carolina. I guarantee you. Um, Coach, I'm not sure if my math is right, if this overlapped or not, but a weird UCF Iowa connection I found. Were you also there when Tristan Spurlock was there? Uh, no, Tristan came, but I've talked to Tristan a lot, um, you know, and he's he's helping him out now. And I I go over to practice uh, occasionally, so you know I see Tristan and stuff, and and I think he was he was in town and knew some of our players and had done some workouts with them and stuff like that. But I retired before he, he joined the staff. Coach, uh, March 2nd, they're hiring the 93, 94 basketball team. The first ever, your, your team, the first team that made the tournament. Will you be in Orlando that day? We Are will. Gonna make yep. yep. We're going to, we're going to fly in there. We changed some of our travel plans um they let me know what i don't know three four weeks ago and and so we changed our travel plans and yeah we're planning on being there so i'm looking forward to seeing those guys again you know hope to see a lot of our former players hopefully they'll they'll all come to the game and we'll be able to see a lot of those guys what's a day like that going to mean to you coach well it's just reconnecting you know you know you 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 spend so much time with those guys and, and then, you know, they get on with their lives and, and we're moving on with a new team, a new group and that type of thing. And, and um, sometimes you stay connected. Sometimes you, you know, you run into people 15, 20 years later, you know, and, and uh, you know, there's some neat stories uh, about those connections. You know, when you run into somebody, you know, down the road or, or get a call. I just got a call from a former player from Pensacola junior college a week ago. Hmm. And I hadn't talked to him in 30 some years, coach, I just heard you retired. I, I want to, and he started listing off all these things that I had told them, you know, years ago. And he says, Hey, there were a lot of days coach that I didn't really like you. Those were the conditioning days that he's talking about, <laughs> <laughs> but, but he says, but I talked, I talked to my son about what you taught me 
every week. You know, I mean, that stuff kind of, you know, that that stays with you, you know, when they when they appreciate some of the life lessons that you try to embark upon them throughout the years. When's the last time you've been on campus? Oh, I've driven through campus, you know, I don't know, a few years ago or something uh, that when we were down in Orlando, but I haven't really been on campus maybe since 2000. 10. Wow. Okay. So this will be, this will be almost like a homecoming to kind of see where things are at and sort of see. Yeah. I mean, things kind of change all the time. Yeah. Things change all the time. If, if we had been in Orlando, you know, doing some things, uh, you know, maybe I'd make a quick wrap around the campus or something, just driving through to see what changes were made. But yeah, this will be the first time that I've really spent some time there. All right. My last one for you, coach. It's a quiz question. What team did you beat for your first ever win as UCF head coach? Shoot. I don't know that I could ever remember that. I, I don't know which one it was. It was. An, it was the 93 team. So you might want to brush up on this while you're, while you're together with the guys. It was do I need Rollins. To, do I, well, that's an exhibition game, wasn't it? Or was that a regular season game? Regular season, November 30th, yeah, 1993. It was, it was Rollins. regular season. I was going to yeah. say Rollins, but... Yeah. 7257. It, yeah. It's it's funny. I I had I couldn't find my 93 94 yearbook. My sister called me like a week ago. She didn't even know all this stuff was going on. She says, "Oh, I just went through some stuff. I got a 93 94 yearbook. Do you want it?" I said, "Well, yeah, I'll take it." <laughs> so, I got to catch up with my stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't awesome. remember those specific things all that well, you know. Some guys can regurgitate who they, you know, who they played first, who they played last, you know, how many points they lost to. I, I kind of move on to the next thing in my life. I don't, I don't kind of log that into my memory banks that, that, uh, that well. Well, coach, we're really glad that you, uh, you, A, you came on and joined us tonight. Thank you so much for spending so much time and giving us so much insight and B really glad to see you back on campus here the next couple of weeks. Like Mike said, you and that 93, 94 team getting celebrated in the, in the arena, Obviously, UCF basketball isn't where it is without without you and your contributions for 17 seasons. So we definitely appreciate you taking some time, and uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to catch up with you again real soon. And you'll maybe you'll get back to a couple games at UCF, and we can connect one of these days on campus when uh, when you're back in Orlando. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much.